we've been talking a lot about what justice is because we've been reading the republic today we're going to talk about what justice is not So once again, we're going to be getting into some dark stuff on this episode. I think it's important to talk about, but it's fair warning that it's going to be pretty heavy. Um, and before we leap in, I just wanted to give you something bright to go on at the beginning. Um, and that is that it's the Christmas season. It's uh, the, well, technically, I guess it's the Advent season. Sorry for all of my uh, liturgical snobs out there. This is the Advent season when we celebrate and anticipate the birth of Christ. And for the entire lead up to Christmas, all of our merchandise is 20% off when you use the promo code Santa at checkout. We have some of the best merch around. It's high quality. I've tested all of it. Um, and I wear it proudly to the gym or just around like at the grocery store. We've got uh, t-shirts with the Young Heretics logo. We've also got We're Reading Homer and Screw You t-shirts, um, Young Heretics hats, stickers, all kinds of great stuff at youngheretics.com forward slash shop and 20% off everything for now with the code Santa. This won't last. It's just until Christmas while I'm feeling generous. Uh, and then when I morph automatically back into my regular Scrooge-like demeanor, uh, this will be over. So don't wait. Go to youngheretics.com forward slash shop and get 20% off with the code Santa. All right. I told you that these episodes on the Soviet Union and the Gulag Archipelago would not be pretty. So steal yourself. Um, there's nothing... Uh, there's no bad language or anything in this episode, but there, there are going to be descriptions of the gulag, which was the system of forced labor and imprisonment, which uh, came into being in the Soviet Union. We talked mostly last week about Lenin, who was the first leader of the Soviet Union and the consolidator of its power over newly revolutionized Russia. We talked about the ways that his grand designs and theory ended him up in a place where millions were dying of starvation and still more were being unjustly executed by the state. Now we're going to talk about Stalin, the inheritor of the Soviet Union, whom no one really expected. Unlike Lenin, who was kind of a middle class guy, Stalin actually was from the working class. But he was not the best known star of the Soviet government under Lenin. That goes to Trotsky, who was the war minister under Lenin during the war. And, and when war communism came, as I described, this complete and sudden nationalization of everything. Um, and when the white army was being stamped out, that was happening under Trotsky. Um, there was a disagreement, as there often were, within the uh Communist Party among the Bolsheviks, there was a disagreement over how to proceed. For Trotsky, the only way to proceed was to communize the whole world. The communist revolution had to happen all over the world in order for it to be complete and possible um, and in order for it to really have occurred, um, to have really taken root in Russia. Stalin thought that they should consolidate the, the revolution, as it were, in Russia. Both were agreed that this was the beginning of what Marxism foretold, which is this great uprising of the proletariat, of the, of the working class. But here's what Stalin wrote later on about Trotsky and the differences between them. I'm getting this, by the way, from Marxists.org, which is a website where I spend perhaps a little too much time. Um, it's a wonderful resource website that collates enormous voluminous writings from Marxists in their own words. And so a lot of this stuff that I was talking about last week with Lenin and his directives to liquidate entire classes of people um, comes from Marxists.org. There are people who still defend this stuff, right? Um, so here's, here's Stalin. Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and those other gentlemen who later became spies and agents of fascism denied that it was possible to build socialism in our country unless the victory of the socialist revolution was first achieved in other countries, in capitalist countries. As a matter of fact, these gentlemen wanted to turn our country back to the path of bourgeois development development, and they concealed their apostasy by hypocritically talking about the victory of the revolution in other countries. This was precisely the point of controversy between our party and these gentlemen. 
Our country's subsequent course of development proved that the party was right and that Trotsky and company were wrong. Four, during this period, we succeeded in liquidating our bourgeoisie, in establishing fraternal collaboration with our peasantry, and in building, in the main, socialist society, notwithstanding the fact that the socialist revolution has not yet been victorious in other countries. This is the position in regard to the first side of the question of the victory of socialism in our country. When Lenin died, he had not named a successor. It wasn't clear who was going to take over. Stalin turned out to be the one, and you can hear in this letter the relentlessness that earned him, uh, if you may call it that, that got him to the head of the party. He says, don't worry about other countries. What our work under Lenin has showed is that socialism can come into being now. And by the way, gradualism is apostasy, right? The idea that maybe some of these changes can come about over time, um, the idea that maybe we need to, you know, work our way toward uh, these things without killing people who disagree with us. Um, all of this is just a mask, a mask for backsliding and retrogression. This would become the psychology of Stalin that dominated the Soviet Union under his tenure, culminating in the 19. 19- 37 Great Purge, which I talked about last week. But one of the things that Solzhenitsyn stresses, remember this is the the writer of the Gulag Archipelago, the great dissident who was himself imprisoned in Gulag um, during, from 1945 onward, he was uh, accused of, of writing letters in which he criticized Stalin. So even though he had fought in World War II uh, in the Russian army, even though he was obviously an admirable uh, so- soldier and intellectual, um, he was imprisoned for having written bad things about Stalin. And that gives you a sense. This is a man whose ruthlessness and whose liquidation of the bourgeoisie is not some kind of mistake, but rather a claim to fame. It, he, he presents it as one of his achievements. Um, Solzhenitsyn talks about Stalin as if he were Satan himself. He talks about Stalin having hooves. I mentioned earlier that he, you know, he lays the death, death after death at Stalin's feet. Um, and if Lenin, you know, is the man that we, if, if in Lenin's rule, we see how gradually utopianism can develop into horror. Um, under Stalin, we see how capable the human consciousness is of fully believing that horror is victory. This is the, the true and total inversion of the human psyche, the human moral consciousness um, displayed across an entire country and in the suffering of millions. It's really a, a drastic and chilling and terrifying thing. And, you know, when I, when I started talking about doing these episodes, my buddy Jonathan, who's also the producer of this show, was talking to me about this idea, never forget, right? Never forget. Um, and we, we say this mostly in reference to the Holocaust, although often sometimes also in reference to 9-11. Um, and there's a kind of naivete to it because it implies, right, that if we just observe how these things happen, um, then it would never happen to us because we're the good guys, right? We're good people. Um, and they, those guys, right, are, are Stalinists, right? Um, but I think one of the things that Stalin shows us in his total conviction that he's in the right, right, in his, in his celebration of the atrocities that he commits, he shows us something that Solzhenitsyn is famous for himself having saying, said, which is the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. So I want to spend some time together today um, going through the atrocities of the uh, Cheka and the interrogation system and the gulag under Stalin. Um, but I also want to spend some time examining how it is that somebody like Stalin um, became emblematic of this government and how it was that the people acquiesced to it. Because if we think that psychologically we're above that or beyond that, or if we think that Sol- Stalin or even Hitler was somebody specially evil um, and that other people you know, like us aren't like that, then we're not really internalizing the true horror of the 20th century and we're not really receiving the fullness of Solzhenitsyn's message, which is an essentially Christian message. So he, you know, Solzhenitsyn was a defender of the Orthodox Church in Russia um, and he was himself one of the great uh, visionaries and prophetic voices of our time because he recognized that humanity could smile and smile and be a villain, to quote Shakespeare, right? Um, So here's how uh, all of this played out. I'm going to read to you first from some passages about what it was like to be interrogated by the uh, 
secret police under Lenin and then under Stalin. If you really want to encounter ancient authors face to face, there is no better way to get up close and personal with the great texts of Western culture than to read them in their own language. And the Ancient Language Institute is the place to go to learn those languages. They teach ancient Greek, Latin, and biblical Hebrew, three languages that have all changed my life and vastly enriched my experience of Western culture. I highly recommend them to all my Young Heretics listeners. They are proud and happy to sponsor us, and we are proud and happy to recommend them. There really is no better place to go if you want to learn these languages. The great thing about them is that they understand why you're there. You are there to learn these languages and get in touch with these texts. So they set you reading people like Virgil, Aristotle, Cicero, the Bible, as quickly as possible. You don't have to go through these hoops and rigmarole of abstruse grammar memorization. Um, They teach through reading as if it were a living language. And this method, I think, just really works. It's for people of all ages and skill levels. You do not have to be a PhD candidate to benefit from this. And you don't have to be a PhD candidate to learn from it. They're really good at teaching people with every level of experience. Um, Right now, their registration is open for spring semester until December 18th. So go to ancientlanguage.com forward slash heretics. It's ancientlanguage.com forward slash heretics, and you'll get a 10% discount on tuition when you use the promo code heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, just like in the title. I mentioned already that Vyshinsky, Andrei Vyshinsky, was the theorist who kind of motivated Stalin in his uh, defense of total relativist government. That is just, you know, good and evil, morally good and bad. Those are determined by the party. The party, it is what the party says it is, right? Um, Thus it was that the conclusions of advanced Soviet jurisprudence, says Solzhenitsyn, proceeding in a spiral, returned to barbaric or medieval standards. Like medieval torturers, our interrogators, prosecutors, and judges agreed to accept the confession of the accused as the chief proof of guilt. However, the simple-minded Middle Ages used dramatic and picturesque methods to squeeze out the desired confessions, the rack, the wheel, the bed of nails, impalement, hot coals, etc. In the 20th century, Taking advantage of our more highly developed medical knowledge and extensive prison experience, and someone seriously defended a doctoral dissertation on this theme, people came to realize that the accumulation of such impressive apparatus was superfluous and that, on a mass scale, it was also cumbersome. In addition, there was evidently one other circumstance. As always, Stalin did not pronounce that final word, and his subordinates had to guess what he wanted. Thus, Like a jackal, he left himself an escape hole so that he could, if he wanted, beat a retreat and write about dizziness from success. After all, for the first time in human history, the calculated torture of millions was being undertaken, and even with all his strength and power, Stalin could not be absolutely sure of success. In dealing with such an enormous mass of material, the effects of the experiment might differ from those it obtained from a smaller sample. An unforeseen explosion might take place, a slippage in a geological fault, or even worldwide disclosure. In any case, Stalin had to remain innocent, his sacred vestments angelically pure. So he's saying he washed his hands of this and let his thugs do the dirty work, which was to torture and imprison millions. And listen to the way that Solzhenitsyn talks about it. It's it's gruesomely masterful. He talks about it in terms of machinery. Um, If you listen to Woodrow Wilson, who was one of the uh, early progressive presidents in America, he gave a speech once on the leaders of men in which he talks expressly about leadership this way. Leaders are those who treat the people as a kind of machine. And who cares why they do or want what they want? Your job as the enlightened leader is to exert your will upon them effectively. Stalin is the sort of epitome of this philosophy in modern times. Um, and, and he's, you know, in, in clear conviction that he's bringing about utopia, um, he effectively brings down the hammer on all the people who are insufficiently revolutionary, which turns out to be everyone. It turns out eventually in The Great Purge, even to be his own party, right? This paranoid turning inward, um, which revolutionary factions always do, right? This was the Jacobins as well in France. Um, This sense that, you know, the party must be ideologically purged and cleansed because the reason things aren't working isn't our bad ideas. It's those pesky uh, counter-revolutionaries within and without the party. And so in Stalin's hands, the government becomes a machine uh, for liquidating the people, full stop. Anybody can find himself 
under this kind of suspicion. Anybody can be reported on. Your private letters, your private effects, even your personal thoughts are all under the heading of what's called Article 58, which is this big, all-inclusive uh, accusation that can be stretched to, to accuse anybody of counter-revolutionary activities. Uh, Solzhenitsyn talks about how it was praised, Article 58 was praised for its flexibility, for allowing uh, you know, counter-revolutionaries to be rooted out everywhere. We talked about how it was they were rooted out among the uh, intellectual elite, right? Among the engineers who just wanted to try to like, you know, ameliorate some of the economic disasters that Lenin had inflicted. And of course, of course, they came for the church. Um, let me read to you a passage uh, from a long series of descriptions of the, the trials that the, uh, the clerisy had to undergo. That is the real clerisy, the, the actual heads of the church. Um, effectively, what happened is that in the wake of the famines that were caused by by Lenin's uh, disastrous policies, the church was commanded to sell its relics and its artifacts and give the money to the poor. And they used this tactic that we use all the time now with Christians. Well, you say you're a Christian, so you ought to, you know, just roll over and die. Isn't that what Jesus said? Like, lay down your life for your fellow man, right? Um, and, and of course, this is always disingenuous because it's always people who don't believe this stuff who are asking you essentially to give of your own flesh and blood um, for their dastardly project, which is exactly what happened um, to the patriarchs and the leaders of the Eastern Orthodox Church um, under Lenin and Stalin. So here, here's a passage about this. Okay, so this is a famine in, in the Volga region, um, and here is how it was dealt with. Right then and there, a surefire campaign of persecution began in the papers, directed against the patriarch and high church authorities who were strangling the Volga region with the bony hand of famine. And the more the patriarch clung to his position, the weaker it became. In March, a movement to relinquish the valuables, to come to an agreement with the government, began even among the clergy. Their still undispelled qualms were expressed to Kalinin by Bishop Antonin Granovsky, a member of the Central Committee of Pomgol. The believers fear that the church valuables may be used for other purposes, more limited and alien to their hearts. Knowing the general principles of our progressive doctrine, the experienced reader will agree that this was indeed very probable. After all, the common turns needs of those of the East in the course of being liberated were no less acute than those of the Volga. The Petrograd metropolitan Venyamin was similarly impelled by a mood of trust. This belongs to God, and we will give all of it by ourselves. But forced requisitions were wrong. Let the sacrifice be of our own free will. So the church is saying, all right, if you're commanding us to lay down all of our property and, and sell things and give to the poor, um, this is actually in the Bible, even though, you know, the, the uh, government is making a mockery of it, that we will do it ourselves. This is a classic, um, you know, personal humanized idea of charity that part of the essence of it is for the individual for one individual to give to another in the name of God and so this is what the church says um he too wanted verification by the clergy and the believers to watch over the church valuables up to the very moment when they were transformed into bread for the starving and in all this he was tormented lest he violate the censuring will of the patriarch in Petrograd, things seemed to be working out peacefully. The atmosphere at the session of the Petrograd Pomgol on March 5, 1922 was even joyful, according to the testimony of an eyewitness. Benjamin announced, the Orthodox Church is prepared to give everything to help the starving. It saw sacrilege only in forced requisition. But in that case, requisition was unnecessary. Kanachikov, chairman of the Petrograd Pomgol, gave his assurances that this would produce a favorable attitude toward the church on the part of of the Soviet government. And then Solzhenitsyn says in parenthesis, not very likely that. So this is one of the arguments against capitulating to the world in the church, right? Is that it always, you always try to gain curry favor with Caesar. Um, and it always turns out to be a fool's bargain. And, and Solzhenitsyn says easy in retrospect to judge them for this, even though of course it makes sense. Um, and so here's what happens. Again, things were getting fouled up. This is from the point of view of the party. Things were getting fouled up with some kind of compromise. The noxious fumes of Christianity were poisoning the revolutionary will. That kind of unity and that way of handing over the valuables were not what the starving people of the Volga needed. The spineless membership of the Petrograd Pomgol was changed. The newspapers began to howl about the evil pastors and princes of the church, and the representatives of the church were told, we don't need your donations, and there won't be any negotiations with you. Everything belongs to the government, and the government will take whatever it considers necessary. 
this is the attitude from the beginning toward Christian charity in the Soviet Union, because of course, ch Christian charity undoes the entire logic of socialism, that promise that the government is going to take people's land and bread away and give it to you in a more equal way, right? The only answer to that is that yes, there are inequalities in society, but virtuous giving can only happen at the level of individual choice. We individuals must choose to give up our possessions. That's what the church wanted to do in Volga, and that was what the socialist government could not abide. Now, that particular episode happened under Lenin. There continued then a devolution of the justice system under Stalin until it became the mere instrument of his paranoia and his just, you know, sort of seething at the mouth. Um, Solzhenitsyn details both what happens in 1937, where, for example, Krylenko, right, the, the grand prosecutor under Lenin, um, finds himself suddenly an enemy of the state, right? That the people who had been previously agents of this persecution then became victims of it um, the next day, especially when Stalin's paranoia got the better of him uh, during the Great Purge. But Solzhenitsyn also just describes this as a constant, right? Just as the way things were, uh, especially under Stalin, but under under both Lenin and Stalin. Um, and so let me read to you now just some of his descriptions of, of the torture implements that were used. Um, this is, I mean, there it, it goes on forever, so it's it's almost too graphic to just go on uh, at, at length, but you can read it, of course, if you so choose, and I think you should. I hear from you guys all the time that you're looking for resources to take your education further, to study the good, the true, and the beautiful. The Magnus Institute is the place to go for that. Go to magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics and check out the amazing work that they are doing. They're named for St. Albert the Great, who is famous for writing on the highest good, de summa bono. Um, and they really uphold that tradition. They are breaking free of our broken education system, and they need your help to ransom the captives of that system. They're running a fundraiser. It starts November 15th, ends December 31st. You can go to magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics to contribute to that, to help them keep their fellowships free. You can apply to the fellowship, and you will get a special gift when you go to magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. Fellows that are subscribed at the amicus level, which is only $25 a month, will get access to this enormous archive, hundreds of hours of recorded course material in literature, philosophy, theology, mathematics, um, just 25 bucks a month, and you are already invited into this treasure trove, really, of fantastic instruction. I trust them implicitly. They're a big part of the answer to fixing our broken education system, and I really think that anybody who likes the show will want to get involved. MagnusInstitute.org forward slash heretics to check all of this out and support their important work. He talks about punishment cells in which people were confined to tiny spaces. He talks about sleeplessness, which was this maniacal way that they would just, you know, after you've been deprived of sleep for uh, enough time, you'll confess to anything, essentially. Um, but let me just read to you this, this one passage, um, because I always think of this passage whenever somebody talks about, you know, defending uh, Stalin or socialism. Anytime somebody defends Stalin or socialism, you just read this passage to them. The most awful thing they can do with you is this undress you from the waist down, place you on your back on the floor, pull your legs apart, seat assistance on them from the glorious corps of sergeants who also hold down your arms. And then the interrogator, and women interrogators have not shrunk from this, stands between your legs and with the toe of his boot or of her shoe, gradually, steadily, and with ever greater pressure, crushes against the floor those organs which once made you a man." He looks into your eyes and repeats and repeats his questions or the betrayal he is urging on you. If he does not press down too quickly or just a shade too powerfully, you still have 15 seconds left in which to scream that you will confess to everything, that you are ready to see arrested all 20 of those people he's been demanding of you, or that you will slander in the newspapers everything you hold holy. And may you be judged by God, but not by people. I bring this up to you not because I want to indulge in like, you know, interrogation porn or, uh, or, or torture porn, um, but because Solzhenitsyn recorded this stuff for a reason. He put it there so that we could see in visceral terms, in almost artistic terms, in the sense of feeling it in our own gut, what the wages of evil are and what the wages of this philosophy was that 
completely disregards and sidesteps and aims to crush human nature in the name of some beautiful dream that the elites had one day. Um, it's important. It's important that we encounter this sort of thing and, and look seriously at the gruesome nature of what went on in the gulag. Um, because Otherwise, we allow ourselves these fantasies, right? This is what Never Forget really is, right? Is that we allow ourselves these fantasies um, that this was some sort of extraordinary thing, um, that this was just an ex especially bad person. But of course, what Solzhenitsyn reminds us of is that actually the opposite is true. Actually, under socialism and under Stalin, the prison system regressed to the level of the Inquisition. I mean, the sheer brutality of what uh, was here, right? That you could you could wring some kind of confession out of somebody by these hideous measures of brutal torture, right? Um, is the lowest form of brutality. It's just this idea that like all we need is the words from you, and then we can arrest twenty other people, and you'll you know you will uh, sacrifice your best friend, or you will curse the name of God um, because we threaten you with this this physical pain. Um, there were people who bore up under this, but as Solzhenitsyn says, may God alone be the one who is able to judge those who caved to this. Um, and the difference between the Inquisition and the Soviet Union is not some, you know, special uh, magic that comes into being with Marx, um, but rather the technological capacities of the Soviet Union. This is why we worry now about digital surveillance, right, is because people get these tools in their hands and the temptation is to use them for domination. And we invent all sorts of ways why that's good, why the why that's actually bringing about, you know, the grand utopia. Um, the metaverse is going to come and Mark Zuckerberg is going to make the perfect universe. But it's all the same, right? New revolutions in technology like the Industrial Revolution can delegitimize systems that had previously been working like feudalism, uh, like serfdom, right? And when you see a government like the czarist government tottering and, and losing its grip on authority, then there exists a void into which, if you are not careful, um, the bad guys will enter. This is essentially what happened in Russia. It's not that the it's not that czarism or or serfdom um, was the way forward into the future. It's that if there is no voice of uh, objective internal morality um, to guide the ship of state into the next stage, whether it be through the digital revolution, which has delegitimized much of our ruling class, or the industrial revolution, which helped to delegitimize Nicholas II, right? Um, whatever it may be, um, if, if you do not have a firm sense of yourself as grounded in eternal truths, then the step that comes next is just a regression into the oldest and most tribal forms of barbarism that always presents itself as the grand advancement into the future. This is what Solzhenitsyn tells us, right? Never forget means never forgetting that we do not transcend our humanity. We never do. And the theory that tells you you're going to because now you have this new technology and, you know, now everything's going to be great um, is always just a regression. It presents itself as progressivism, always says it's moving forward into the future, always drags us back into the past. Why is it that our new race consciousness has us talking like 19th century eugenicists? Well, it's because when you tell people that actually what's going to happen now is we're going to give up on all that human nature stuff. We're going to give up on all that eternal truth. We're going to give up on, you know, the brotherhood of man. And we're just going to see things the new way, which is in the way of race, right? This is the same impulse. It's this new grand progressivism that gets you back at the level of dirt, right? That drives you back into these tribal ways of thinking, into these violent ways of thinking, into a gulag that only looks better than the Inquisition or different from the Inquisition because its technology is more advanced and its means are more secretive. You guys, these days there's practically only one thing we eat for dinner at my house, and it's Omaha steaks. These guys are so good. They've sent me these phenomenal packages of steak, chicken breast, sides, desserts, everything you could need, you name it. This is phenomenal for really any family occasion or gathering or just a meal at home, but it's particularly good for Christmas. And that's the deal that they are offering just Young Heretics listeners, just to make sure that you know how to get it, because uh, you won't get it unless you do this. Go to omahasteaks.com and enter heretics into the search bar. Then you'll get the perfect gift package, which has those bacon wrapped filet mignons, the chicken breasts, the sides, the desserts, and 
and lots of other stuff. In fact, when you use that Heretics in the search bar, you'll also get an additional eight Omaha Steaks burgers for free. The whole thing all together, including the eight free burgers, is $99.99, just 100 bucks. That's less than half the usual price. They're offering this just for you. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter Heretics into the search bar to get this. It's a really top-notch food for very low price and not that hard to prepare either. So achieve gifting greatness with Omaha Steaks. Incredible flavor, incredible value, and 100% guaranteed. One more time, it's omahasteaks.com. Put heretics in the search bar, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, just like in the title of the show. All right, enjoy. Let's get back to the show. I want to talk now for the time that remains about the psychology of the people who executed Stalin's regime, and not just the people who had power or who were in charge, but the people who lived under it and acquiesced to it. Because that's, I think, one of the things that these days we most puzzle over, right? How is it that people um, can just not hear themselves when they say things like, you know, I want vaccines forced into people's arms? How is it that they don't hear themselves when they say we need papers to be asked for at the door of every restaurant, right? Um, Solzhenitsyn has wonderful commentary on this because he understands what I said at the beginning, which is that actually there's a Stalin in each of us, right? And those of us who don't think there is are kidding ourselves, right? Jesus talks about this and the Bible is, you know, unanimous on it, that the works of man's heart are evil continually, right? Anybody who has said to his brother, you fool, is already liable for Gehenna. And what that must mean is that the impulses of our heart are already, um, if allowed to flourish in their own way, capable of the, the worst and most hideous evil. It's not some special demon that lives in Stalin, although eventually perhaps you may consider him an agent of Satan, right? Um, it's just what happens when the human heart is fed the lies that allow it to indulge it um, in, in sin in the name of some high grand ideal. What makes people go along with this, right? This is the question that everybody asks. It's a, it's a question that Solzhenitsyn deals with really well in his chapter on the blue caps, who are the sort of exec executors of the business of the secret police. Um, I'm going to read to you first this, this one paragraph and then a, a longer description of the um, sort of character profile of these people. He writes, although others might not be aware of it, it was clear to the interrogators at least that the cases were fabricated. Except at staff conferences, they could not seriously say to one another or to themselves that they were exposing criminals. Nonetheless, they kept right on producing depositions page after page to make sure that we rotted. So the essence of it all turns out to be the credo of the Blatnye, the underworld of Russian thieves. You today, me tomorrow. That, that credo, right? It's going to be me tomorrow, but today it's you, right? It's this essential human foible that we have, where we think that if we can just get one more hour of peace, we'll sacrifice, you know, 20, 30 years down the line. We talk about this all the time in every kind of context, big and small. If I can just sit on the couch today, it won't matter that I haven't exercised in a month, right? We talk about like, you know, so that's at a very local pedestrian level. Um, and then we talk about, you know, I just want to consume everything around me um, and who cares about the environment, right? I mean, of course, like you know, environmental crazies are crazies, but the other thing is crazy too, where we're just like, yeah, we'll just, you know, tear up the entire earth um, and who cares about the future down the line? We'll just incur more debt, right? And who cares about our children? Uh, we'll just add to the debt, uh, the national debt, um, and our children will pay for it. This constant sense that if, if we can have a little bit of peace now, um, we can deal with hell later. Of course, in its infinite sense, that is what hell is, right? It's just if I can just have peace on this earth, it doesn't matter if I'm consigned to hell for all eternity. It's exactly the opposite way that we ought to be thinking is the way that people think all the time. So that's the first thing that, that Solzhenitsyn says about the blue caps. They're thinking this way, right? It'll be me tomorrow, but it's you today. Here's the next part. Remember what Tolstoy said about power? Ivan Ilyich had accepted a, an official position, which gave him authority to destroy any person he wanted to. All, without exception, were in his hands, and anyone, even the most important, could be brought before him as an accused. And that's just where our blue boys are. There is nothing to add to the description. So he's saying this novel, Ivan Ilyich, by Tolstoy, describes before the fact the position in which these secret police found themselves. The consciousness of this power 
and the possibilities of using it mercifully, so Tolstoy qualifies the situation, but this does not in any way apply to our boys, constituted for Ivan Ilyich the chief interest and attraction of the service. But attraction is not the right word. It is intoxication. After all, it is intoxicating. You are still young, still, shall we say, parenthetically, a sniveling youth. Only a little while ago, your parents were deeply concerned about you and you didn't know where to turn to launch your life. You were such a fool that you didn't even want to study, but you got through three years of that school and then how you took off and flew, how your situation changed, how your gestures changed, your glance, the turn of your head. The learned council of the Scientific Institute is in session. You enter and everyone notices and trembles. You don't take the chairman's chair. Those headaches are for the rector to take on. You sit off to one side, but everyone understands that you are head man there. You are the special department, and you can sit there for just five minutes and then leave. You have that advantage over the professors. You can be called away by more important business. But later on, when you're considering their decision, you will raise your eyebrows or, better still, purse your lips and say to the rector, you can't do that. There are special considerations involved. That's all, and it won't be done. Or else you are an osobist, a state security representative in the army, a smershman, that's S-M-E-R-S-H, and a mere lieutenant. But the portly old colonel, the commander of the unit, stands up when you enter the room and tries to flatter you, to play up to you. He doesn't even have a drink with his chief on staff without inviting you to join them. In his essay on the inner ring, C.S. Lewis talks about the intoxication and the allure of being on the inside being on the inside of power. And maybe it just costs you this one compromise, right? Just this one thing that you have to leave aside. Maybe you need to lie. Just tell one lie. The minute you make that choice, your life is at the mercy of power. And you, in exchange, gain power. You become, right, he says you're were, you were just a sniveling youth before. Now you're part of the secret police. You have power over your fellow man. But of course, you are constantly under what is called the sword of Damocles because now you have submitted to this regime which just takes people at will on the basis of suspicion, on the basis of, of whispered reports. And Solzhenitsyn himself knew what this was like because he had been not in the secret police but in the army and then suddenly discovered that he was the object of suspicion and uh, condemned because of his private letters. This, this psychology is very powerful and very profound. Just look at the way that people talk about the unvaccinated or the way that people react when Jen Psaki says, uh, you know, hideous, nasty things about rural America and the unvaccinated. Um, as long as you're not in that group, it's really, really easy to cheer on. Yeah, get them, right? Get them. You know where we've really seen this on display? And this is where I'm going to start transitioning to talking about our criminal justice system the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. On the day of this recording, as I'm recording this, Rittenhouse was just declared not guilty. And there was enormous celebration of this, and rightly so, because it was obvious from the footage, it was obvious from the trial itself, um, that he was not guilty under the law, besides which what he did was virtuous. He went to Kenosha. Everybody said he crossed state lines, but he like lives on state lines. So it wasn't really you know, this, the, this vigilantism. It was an effort to protect businesses that were being looted and set on fire. Um, he ended up killing people, uh, and therefore he was tried for murder. Now, it is a great victory, a great day for American justice that normal people still look at the facts of that case and vote to acquit him because it's obviously the right decision. But why should they even have to? Well, it's because Rittenhouse was turned into an an object of ritual scapegoating. We talked about this when we talked about Girard, and this is another way in which Soviet dynamics are much older and deeper than just like Marxism, right? Um, we, <laughs> A system which has no sense of Christian virtue is a system which must ultimately offload its own sins onto somebody, um, somebody else, right? The other guy. And we all, you know, watched in horror as a certain segment of our population, right? The pagan segment, essentially, of our population howled for this boy to be condemned to life in prison. Why? Not because they knew any of the facts of the case, not because the facts of the case mattered, but simply because he was the object of our latest ritual hatred, right? Uh, Orwell in 1984, right? The depiction of life under a, a hyper-technologically advanced imaginary Soviet Union, right? Has the two minutes hate. Um, 
it's a very Soviet phenomenon, but it's also a deeply primal and pagan phenomenon to offload all of our own sense and fear of being condemned. Our sense of it's me, to, it's you today, me tomorrow, right? Offload all that onto somebody that we simply decide to hate. We decide he's a white supremacist, even though the people he killed were white and he is white, right? Um, we decide that he is this embodiment of all the evils that we've invented in order to keep from looking at ourselves. Now, as I've stressed before in previous episodes, right? We are not in a position where things are as bad as the Soviet Union, precisely because we still have a court system in which the, the God-loving, God-fearing American people, um, and may, you know, may they be blessed for this, right, can look at the facts and acquit. But our press did everything it could to foment riots in the wake of this decision. And as of this recording, who knows whether they will have succeeded? I actually don't know because I'm in the studio and who can say? Um, but I'm talking about it in real time because it is in some sense, a, a major barometer in our ongoing crisis. This was this day, this event, um, and this whole trial has been a serious temperature taking uh, moment for the American Republic, precisely because it raises all of these echoes of the system that was in full bore and full force in the Soviet Union, where you were simply guilty because you fit the wrong narrative, and now you were to be condemned to all sorts of horrors. Um, on Twitter, I saw a you know a very virtuous leftist um, posting that when Kyle dissolved into tears on the stand in recollection of the trauma he'd been through, um, that was the face he was going to make for the first time in the prison showers, right? These are our betters. These are our elites in this country, right? Who, who want to celebrate prison rape um, on the basis of no facts, but purely because they are engaged in a ritualistic pagan sacrifice, which if it were allowed to conclude would look exactly like the gulag. It's not that we are at the point of having a gulag in this country. It's that the logic of gulag is an ancient primal evil logic, um, which is at work in our American crisis and against which we must set ourselves. So all the huffing and puffing about socialism is meaningless unless it refers to this, unless it refers to the deep and ancient evil that reared its head in the heart of Stalin and in the people who obeyed him. Let's talk about the normal people now. I'm going to read one last passage from Solzhenitsyn. It's one of the most famous passages, and it's a footnote. His footnotes are phenomenal, by the way. They are models of journalism. Um, this whole thing is compiled from interviews, from official documents, from sources that the, the Soviet Union itself put out. A lot of the rec records of the trials were put down by Krylenko himself. Um, and, and Solzhenitsyn does this wonderful job of drawing out their inner logic. Um, so his footnotes are, you know, if you do end up reading the whole thing, then the footnotes are... are part of the fun. Um, but here's, uh, here's what he has to say about the arrests, the waves and waves of arrests that went on under both Lenin and Stalin. He says, how we burned in the camps later, thinking, what would things have been like if every security operative, when he went out at night to make an arrest, had been uncertain whether he would return alive and had to say goodbye to his family, or if during periods of mass arrests, as for example in Leningrad, when they arrested a quarter of the entire city, people had not simply sat there in their lairs, paling with terror at every bang of the downstairs door and every step on the staircase, but had understood they had nothing left to lose and had boldly set up in the downstairs hall an ambush of half a dozen people with axes, hammers, pokers, or whatever else was at hand. After all, you knew ahead of time that those blue caps were out at night for no good purpose, and you could be sure ahead of time that you'd be cracking the skull of a cutthroat. Or what about the Black Maria sitting out there on the street with one lonely chauffeur? What if it had been driven off or its tires spiked? The organs would very quickly have suffered a shortage of officers and transport and, notwithstanding all of Stalin's thirst, the cursed machine would have ground to a halt. If, if we didn't love freedom enough, and even more, we had no awareness of the real situation, we spent ourselves in one unrestrained outburst in 1917, and then we hurried to submit. We hurried with pleasure. Arthur Ransom describes a workers' meeting in Yaroslavl in 1921. Delegates were sent to the workers from the Central Committee in Moscow to confer on the substance of the argument about trade unions. The representative of the opposition 
uh, Lauren explained to the workers that their trade union must be their defense against the administration, that they possessed rights which they had won and upon which no one else had any right to infringe. The workers, however, were completely indifferent, simply not comprehending whom they still needed to be defended against and why they still needed any rights. When the spokesman for the party line rebuked them for their laziness and for getting out of hand and demanded sacrifices from them, overtime work without pay, reductions in food, military discipline, and the factory administration, this aroused great elation and applause. We purely and simply deserved everything that happened afterward. We didn't love freedom enough. Underneath that psychological mechanism that leaves the blue caps in charge of you because they, you know, they know that they're next, but they just can't internalize it, right? Is this sense that we don't actually have to stand up, right? It's, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's not bad enough yet. And I would hate for you to take me to be saying that we are in a position where it's not bad enough yet. I'm saying it's not bad enough yet for us to rise up in arms in the streets, right? I mean, Solzhenitsyn is describing a, a significantly more deteriorated situation than ours. But the, pre the premise and the principle is the same, which is that now is the time to get over your sense that if you can just keep your peace for one more day, um, it doesn't matter what you give up. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again and again. There is no substitute for courage, and there is no substitute for being the guy who says that thing that's on everybody's mind. Like being the guy who says, you know, I, I, I don't think this, this mask mandate makes sense, and I'm not going to follow it. For being the guy that says, you know what, I, I, you know, everybody in class is all towing one radical leftist line, and I'm risking losing my grades. I'm risking, you know, maybe getting a bad grade on this essay, but I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say what I believe. If you don't get used to doing that, you will lose everything in the end at any point, right, in that process. Um, until you lose your freedom, you can say at, that you are the one who will say no and you will find that others are encouraged and inspired by your example. These things have a snowball effect, but it takes enormous courage for one person to stand up and say no. The point at which it's too late will be the point in which you burn, right? He says we burned in the camps, right? That regret is the regret of not understanding um, what's at stake in any given encounter. The jury in the Rittenhouse trial is an excellent example of people who understood what was at stake. They were under threat. They were hounded by the press. There were serious uh, possibilities that their identities might be revealed and they might be pursued in their homes. This is one of the reasons why, even though justice was done in the narrow sense, our justice system was revealed to be corrupt by this trial is because there were these, there are constantly now these threats of riots, these threats of persecution hanging over people who are just doing their jobs, who are just defending uh, the innocent or indeed participating in the court system at all. You should have read the stories that the press wrote about, well, you know, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse was able to choose his jurors, which was just a like meaningless non-story about the fact that there's a, a random raffle to select which jurors decide, and Rittenhouse was the one who pulled the paper out of the raffle box. But this persecution that the jury faced, right, they were at an extreme moment of choosing, and they are American heroes who we hope, we hope we will never meet, right? We hope that their names will remain uh, under the protection of the courts uh, because you know, they, the reason that they are exemplifying what Solzhenitsyn is talking about here is not because they took to the streets, but because in their context, they understood that their personal comfort and safety um, was not worth the unjust persecution of this boy who is being ha harried um, by state operatives. That's the kind of courage I'm talking about. And it doesn't always look like civil war. In fact, most of the time, it doesn't, right? Most of the time, it looks like you understanding that the thing you stand to lose isn't worth anything if you gain it at the cost of your freedom and your dignity. I say again, people who wring their hands about socialism coming to the U.S. are just saying words unless they are reckoning and grappling with the reality of what socialism represents, which is the profound capacity for evil in the human heart and the deep temptation 
for a million, million reasons to call good evil and evil good. That is not limited to Stalin and Lenin. Stalin and Lenin are not special people in that respect. That's in the book of Isaiah from the 700s BC, right? This is the, the specter that haunts human thought from the beginning, from the days of Socrates and Isaiah, the specter of abandoning objective truth and the reality of human nature in the name of some perfect future that you've dreamed up in your lab so that now you're going to oppress millions. That's the lesson I hope we learn from these first forays into the Gulag Archipelago. Just the beginning. We'll be doing lots more episodes on this, but we are going to leave it aside for now. Have you ever pulled up your credit card bill and found like an ancient subscription charge and realized that like your ex or somebody is still using your Netflix account or whatever? Um, Truebill is the app to fix all of that. They help you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. This is how big companies scam you. They sign you up for a free trial. The free trial rolls over into a, you know, yearly subscription. And then the yearly subscription auto renews. All of a sudden you're paying up to $720 a year. That's how much people save on average with Truebill by just cutting out extraneous subscriptions that they don't need. Whatever it is, your face app, your Netflix, your yada yada stuff that you've sort of forgotten about in the background, Truebill will find it and nix it. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today. Go to Truebill.com slash heretics. It honestly could save you thousands of dollars a year. It saved me a bundle already. Go to Truebill.com slash heretics and cancel your old unwanted subscriptions. But don't cancel your local subscription. Um, we have a service that I think you really will love, and that is youngheretics.com forward slash locals, where people go deeper into the themes of this show, apply the great principles of the West to their lives, and in conversation with one another, the VIPs on locals are really, I think, one of the most special communities out there. I love to be a part of it. I'm honored to lead it. Um, and it's a place where you can get all sorts of extra stuff beyond just the episodes. You'll get those a week in advance, but you'll also get essays that I write exclusively for locals. There's a Young Heretics Advent calendar that is uh, only running during the Christmas season, of course, where I translate a new verse of the Bible every day and explain to people what the Greek means. Um, all sorts of fun stuff, weekly Q&As that you can only access if you're a VIP. And it's cheaper now than it has ever been before because we're running a Christmas special. Up to the 25th, leading up to Christmas, you can get a yearly membership for 40 bucks. It's usually 56 bucks to sign up for the whole year. Now you can get it for just 40 bucks all the way until Christmas. You don't need any kind of code or promo or anything. You just go to youngheretics.com forward slash locals and sign up for an annual VIP membership for 40 bucks until the 25th. You want to sign up now because you won't get the advent calendar if you don't, and you won't get the special deal unless you sign up before Christmas day. Okay, let's turn to the mailbag, which comes to me through locals. Here's antisocial critic, a locals VIP. And he's been raising this as a discussion question, so we've been talking about it internally, but I wanted to bring it up uh, in the show too. To what degree should we consider John Milton heretical or a bad influence on Western Civ? He's most famous for Paradise Lost, but he was also a proponent of divorce, seemed to support political violence in some regards, held heterodox and heretical Christian opinions and such. What are the best things he put forward that still hold up today? So, okay. There are two questions here. There's a purely technical question. Was he a heretic? And then there is a sort of m m grand moral assessment of Milton, right? Uh, he was a heretic. He was an Arian. He believed that uh, Jesus was not uh, co-eternal and co-divine with God. Um, and so in so positing, he, uh, at least in his own personal theology and in some of his writings, um, destroyed the unity of the Trinity. Um, there are all sorts of philosophical problems with that. But I think that this is a good opportunity to reckon with the complexity of people. And it's easy for us to reckon with people's complexity when we're defending uh, historical figures from cancel culture, right? Robert E. Lee, uh, people will say, oh, he was an evil racist. We have to tear his statue down. And we'll say, well, actually, the, you know, the context of his time was much different. And some things he did were good and some things he did were bad. But in fact, he made these achievements. Um, Christopher Columbus, right? Like, you know, we look back with horror on some of the things that uh, colonization involved, but we're glad that America exists and we're glad that the New World was ultimately occupied by Europeans and therefore we, uh, you know, can contextualize some of the things that uh, that we, you know, find distasteful today. Um, we should do the same thing when we, when we start asking these questions about, like, is somebody a heretic or not, right? And I don't mean heresy in the sense of the title of the show, right, but actual heresy, right? Um, the fact remains that Paradise Lost is in my opinion, the greatest poem 
written in the English language is certainly one of them, and it's a tremendous gift to believers. It has made the theological and moral and ethical world of Christianity alive for many, many people. In itself, it does not really express Arianism, so it's not affected, in my opinion, by his more heretical views. Um, and, and his political views uh, make sense in their time, right? He was a revolutionary against the political oppression of the Puritans, and he wanted to bring the English church uh, back to a more sort of, uh, back to a, what it would look like in America, essentially, right? Back to local representation, um, back to simplicity of worship. Uh, and he talks about this in, in Paradise Lost, that Adam and Eve just bring spontaneous worship from their own hearts, right? They don't need all the paraphernalia of the, of the Catholic Church. Um, and yes, it, it, there are places in which he overstepped and later, I think, had to reconsider. So, for example, the beheading of King Charles, right? Um, remember that that was early in his career, and he wrote in defense of it. He was imprisoned for it, would have been killed if not for the intervention of his friends. And the consequences of that were that he lived to see the disastrous uh, coming apart of the Republican government and the restoration and the return of the monarchy. And in Paradise Lost, we have a lot of that. We have a lot of his wrestling with, you know, the satanic logic of rebellion against the natural order of things. Um, this is an incredibly complex person who was obviously inspired by God to write some of the things he wrote. And I don't think we need to pronounce on him as, like, evil or good. Um, just like I was talking about with Solzhenitsyn, that the line, that line runs between every human heart. I think Overall, the things he left to us are gifts to the world. Um, it's for God to judge the ultimate, you know, state of his soul. We don't have to agree with him about Arianism in order to appreciate some of the things that he said. Um, and in answer to best things he put forward, right, um, the Area Pagitica, which I covered earlier, is a good example of one of the earliest arguments and most cogent arguments for freedom of speech, along with some of the stuff that uh, Thomas More said. So, I would, I would caution against, right, wanting to condemn him because he had heretical views outright entirely as a person. Life is more complex than that, and that's one of the things we're always insisting about um, in face of cancel culture. Thank you, Antisocial Critic, for that stimulating question. I uh, love to talk about John Milton. We'll talk more with you and others about him among the VIPs on Locals. Go to youngheretics.com forward slash locals to become a VIP. We'd really love to see you there. That's it for me this week. If you like this show, you will love the Claremont Institute. It's where I work. We've put out two publications, The American Mind and The Claremont Review of Books, uh, both excellent in my humble opinion. And you can donate to support our work at claremont.org slash donate. If you do, let them know in the notes that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics. Thanks, as always, for being with us. Thank you for uh, trudging with me through some depressing material these last two weeks. I hope it's been edifying to you, um, and I hope it's been helpful to think about. Um, I'm really grateful to be here with you and to have this platform um, in which to share these important thoughts with you. I will see you next week for more Truth, Beauty, and the Stuff that Matters.